this is a list of different certifications that you can get that would map to different sort of fields in the IT realm. And uh, I just want to point out, though, that this did come out a couple of years ago uh, when they come out with a new A plus book, which should be later this year, uh, they will update this. So there's a couple ones like, for example, the Microsoft certifications, things like the MCSA, uh, they've changed a lot of their certifications around in the last uh, couple of years. So that won't be 100% accurate. But this is a really great document here. So what this shows, and now this might, you could argue it's maybe CompTIA biased because it's their uh, certification roadmap, but they have a number of other certifications that are non-CompTIA. You'll see stuff like Cisco, which is more for networking. You'll see stuff, like I said, for Microsoft, which is just widely useful because so many people use Microsoft uh, Windows and Windows Server and things like that. Um, but regardless of this having a bit of a CompTIA skew, I think if you asked anybody in the IT industry, they would tell you to start out with CompTIA. Uh, I couldn't recommend enough. So if you look at these different paths, so what this document is, I can zoom in a little bit here. Uh, it's maybe a little too close. But if you look over on the right, you can see there are different kind of career paths, basically, that we have over here. So there's information security, network and cloud technologies, hardware services and infrastructure, IT management and strategy, storage and data, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a bunch of them. And software development is huge right now, actually. Um, but that's kind of a whole other animal if you wanted to learn how to um, code, basically, or script or program any of those words there if you want to get into software development. There's a lot of demand for that, and that also can provide you with some remote work. But that's kind of another branch off from this. Like I said, that would be something that you would, uh, it's just one of the many paths you can take. It really is a whole different world. It really is, yeah. So there's so many different paths here. Uh, and really, it's, this is the beauty of the IT industry in general is that you can basically do anything. There's such a wide variety of things. You wanna work in a data center, you wanna work with networking and IP addresses and routing traffic. And do you wanna work in the cloud? That's where everything's going these days. You're gonna work with virtual networks, virtual machines, and everything's virtualized, uh, which I'll explain a little bit about uh, a little bit later. I'll demo a little virtualization for you guys, which is kind of fun. And uh, where you turn all of your hardware components into software stuff and you manage it like software, which is pretty cool. And that's kind of the, the way the world is going these days. Everything's running the cloud. All your favorite apps, everything you do, your, you know, every app you have on your phone, your TikToks, your Snapchats, you know, all that stuff, it's all running the cloud, all of it. That's what makes it so scalable. That's what, that's what has allowed these apps to boom and flourish because they are essentially infinitely scalable as long as there's demand and there's money coming in, basically. So uh, yeah, so the cloud is really going, uh, you know, everywhere so that's a big one to get into um, but it really all starts no matter which industry which path you want to take and you could get if you're more hardware oriented you could get into specific jobs where you repair things or that's your job you repair computers and laptops and there's actually specific stuff like the general rule is you should never repair things like power supplies and other things like that but there's there's niche jobs for everything right so there's a lot of stuff that you could really get into here like actually repairing of motherboards like soldering components back on if that's more your your speed you know you can get a big magnifying glass basically and kind of work on stuff you know so there's you know the sky's the limit basically if you like if you like programming if you like automating things you know that's the the software development world um, if you like uh, planning and strategy, and uh, if you like an analyzing risk and, and thinking of disasters and what to do, you know, you can get into disaster recovery planning and risk planning and, and assessment. Um, and, you know, that would be under things like IT management and strategy. Um, so much, so much. And the beauty is you can work for basically any company. Everybody needs like people who know computers, right? In some form or fashion, right? They, they all have like your traditional kind of IT person you might think of, which might be called like a system administrator is a very common job. Somebody who manages the office, right? That's what everyone thinks of when they think of like the IT person, but it's so much more expansive than that. So I just kind of wanted to, to introduce uh, you guys to this here so you can get an idea of just what kind of certifications are out there and which ones might help you down a particular career path. Um, I would advise you though, talk to your education advisor or guidance counselor at New Horizons, and uh, they can help you um, a little bit better, you know, if you're, but the great thing about this document, they tell you what all the certs are. If you, if you scroll down, you get a little bit more information about the certs. So it's not just an acronym here, you know, you may look at the acronym and be like, okay, I guess I have to Google that, but they tell you a little bit more about it. I mean, you certainly should Google it, but at least they tell you a little bit more about it uh, further down here, if you just kind of scroll down. So yeah, so it's a nice little document there. Um, 
And uh, one thing I want to mention, and then I, I noticed a couple things in chat I'll get to. Uh, one thing I want to mention, though, about this, like I said, even though it's got a bit of a, a CompTIA slant, I think anyone would recommend. Like if you go and, and check anything online, you go to YouTube, you, 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 know, you, you Google it. If you ask anybody, what certification should you get? I want to get into IT. What should I do? I would recommend, and then most people will, A+, plus, Network+, plus, and Security+, plus for sure. Now, everything's going into cloud, so if you want to go that way, you could look into that one, um, but I think that I call them the big three, A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus. I think that gives you an excellent foundation, because these classes, the A+, plus classes, are very broad, uh, very wide, or just different ways you could say it, where they, they cover a lot of things, and as you guys will see, as we take a closer look at the A+, plus and we break, and we break down the objectives a little bit, you guys will see there's a heck of a lot of stuff in there, and uh, I always describe it a couple of different ways. It's, it's a mile long, but an inch deep. <laughs> so you need, or, or another way to say that is you need to know a little bit about a lot of things to pass the certification because uh, A plus in particular is really just an introduction to like everything. Um, then you get into stuff like network plus, which does a deeper dive into networking, which is very important for anything in the computing world, basically. And then security, that's gonna open up doors if you wanna get government jobs and stuff like that. Uh, pretty much any kind of government job or government contractor type of job. If you want to go work for a, a defense contractor or some other industry that works closely with the government, you're going to need Security Plus to do it. So, uh, so that one could certainly open up some doors and really everything should have a foundation in security in general. And you learn a lot of really good stuff there. Um, but uh, that's where everyone should start. And then from there, whatever you're interested in, you want to get into hacking, you can take Certified Ethical Hacker. You can get into pen test plus cybersecurity analyst casp you can go down the road there um you want to get into programming there's a number of different courses for that depending on the type of language you want to learn or, or if you want to get into uh, powershell or java or python or whatever um you want to get into you know scripting for cloud-based stuff so the sky's the limit guys i just wanted to kind of start with that and let you know um and like i said because every company needs it people you know, not only can you go to websites and look for IT jobs, but you can really go to any company that you want to work for and just see specifically what openings they have, right? So that's another kind of avenue you can take because, you know, every company has IT people or have some people, you know, do something with computers in their industry, uh, probably a lot of people. Uh, a lot of companies have internal developers who develop in-house software and stuff. So, uh, so many options for you guys if you get into this. And uh, I encourage you to look around if you want to get a, a feel for what is actually out there. I encourage you to visit, you know, job hunting websites in your area, things like dice.com, or there's still like Indeed and Monster are still used. LinkedIn um, is used for that a lot. Um, I haven't been on the job hunt in a while, been with New Horizons, happy where I am uh, for quite a while now, but uh, I know there's a lot of avenues out there. And that'll give you a feel for like what kind of pay you can expect to get into entry level, depending on where you live and uh, what sorts of jobs are really out there that you could um, pursue. So uh, I want to start out with that, just kind of uh, mention all this stuff, all these other certifications. So uh, we're going to take a little bit of a look at A+, plus, though. Um, and I just want to give you a brief overview of what's in this. Then we'll look closer at the objectives, and then we'll talk about the exam. So uh, let me take a look. I think I missed a couple of things here in chat. Yep, cloud computing. I mentioned saw that it's in demand. Absolutely. And you can select a path based on your choices. Yep, that's what it is. So really, again, I would start with those those fundamental things. A plus network plus security. Um, you could argue like if you've got if you're already in IT or something and like you've got a ton of experience with computers and networks and you could argue that maybe skipping A plus um, if you have 10 years of experience, some people might be like, I don't need to go back and get A plus. But I but anybody who's new to the industry, 100%, you have to start here. Like you have to. Um, because this will introduce you to everything. You really don't want to just like jump into Network Plus when you don't know how computers are built. You don't know the stuff inside the computer. You don't know how they work, right? So you really have to get that foundation and then you build on it, okay? Um, so yeah, A Plus, yeah, the only, the only people I wouldn't recommend it to are people who are longtime IT industry people already, you know? And, uh, you know, that's not what we're talking about here today. Uh, but yeah, anybody getting in the industry, this is what you should be looking at. So I want to give you guys kind of a quick little overview before we look at just the text, you know, I could pull up PDF documents and stuff all day long and just kind of look at the text. And there's a, certainly a lot of it. Like I said, this book is over 1200 pages. Um, you know, there's so much to it. This is our actual book here. You get installing and configuring PC components, display and multimedia devices, storage, internal stuff, CPUs, you know, we'll talk about all that networking, security, um, 
operational procedures, you know, and uh, really just so much stuff in this book. Like I said, over 1200 pages of information and uh, yeah, really, really pretty crazy uh, ultimately. Um, but yeah, I want to give you guys a quick little overview. So there, uh, the CompTIA A plus is broken into two exams. Um, the first exam is going to primarily cover hardware and networking. Okay, so the kind of stuff you would learn about in hardware, I've got a little image here, I should, um, for example, would be what's inside of a computer, right? Now, we all know what computers look like on the outside, right? Uh, if you have a tower computer, it's a, usually probably a black rectangular box, you know, there's not really too much there, and they can vary in shapes and sizes a little bit there as well. But when you open up a computer, and this is one of the very first things you're going to want to learn is what's inside a computer, how do they work? How do you build them? How do you take them apart? And the good news is it's actually pretty simple. Uh, you'd be kind of surprised. I kind of call it adult Legos, basically, when you're building a computer. That's kind of how I look at it, where you're really just snapping a couple pieces together and, uh, and you plug everything in, you power it on and keep your fingers crossed, right? <laughs> Hopefully everything boots up just fine, you know? Um, but, uh, but it usually does, you know, it's not not too difficult of a process. Um, but what you're seeing here in this image, I can maybe zoom in a little bit more. Um, this is what you're looking at when you open up the side of a computer. So the way that you get into a computer is almost always, I mean, there's some different cases out there, but it's almost always gonna be from the left-hand side. If you're looking at a computer front on, a computer case, you're gonna open up from the left-hand side. And that's what you're looking at here is the inside of the computer from the left. Um, so that means the right-hand side, that would be the front of the computer. So that's where you'll have things, for example, like a CD-ROM. You probably don't have one of those anymore. Uh, maybe a Blu-ray player or maybe none at all, because nowadays we don't really use optical drives all that often. Um, but that's where that would be, right? Makes sense that would be on top in case the computer's lower to the ground. You can reach the uh, CD tray kind of easily there. Um, you'll also have things like your hard drives down here over stored on the right hand side and the hard drive is where you store all of your information in uh, a more in a permanent way on the computer or you know semi permanent right it could be deleted it could be corrupted it could uh, the drive could fail uh, you know there are things you got to back up your data and stuff like that but you know that's where the hard drive would be stored which you know stores all the programs and all the files and everything that's on your computer uh, but the the main thing here when you open up a computer is the motherboard. So the motherboard is this rectangle, that's blue rectangle that we have back there that you can see outlined. Uh, the motherboard actually here, I think I can draw on this a little bit to kind of point things out a little bit more perhaps. Um, yeah, that'll work. That'll work, okay. Um, so yeah, it's this guy right here. This is the motherboard. You can kind of see it. I know the picture can be a little bit difficult. I strongly recommend, uh, it, for anybody who's getting into A plus or getting into IT, I would strongly recommend if you have a computer at home, open it up and take a look inside. Now, don't touch anything unless you know what you're doing. Certainly don't go yanking anything out or doing anything like that, right? Uh, but always good to get comfortable with what's in there. And it probably could use a dusting as well inside. Uh, so if you if you don't usually open up your computer, which uh, I would imagine the average person probably doesn't open up their computer too often unless they are a computer kind of oriented person. Uh, so yeah, I could probably use a dusting while you're in there. Uh, you can get a can of compressed air or something like that. But uh, but anyway, uh, we do talk about maintenance of computers as well in the class. Uh, but yeah, it all kind of starts with that motherboard, right? So the motherboard is kind of like the backbone of the computer, right? It's where everything kind of plugs into. And then you've got your main components that you can see here. You've got the CPU. Now you don't normally see the CPU. It's that square kind of right in the middle. Uh, this is usually covered up by some sort of cooling element, usually something like a heat sink and a fan, which is like a block of metal and a fan that helps cool it down. Um, or maybe there's stuff like liquid cooling, uh, which there's some pretty crazy stuff out there for that, which cools it with uh, liquid like a water. Um, but you can see the CPU here just for demonstration purposes. That's like the brains of the computer. Uh, it's actually more like an efficient sorting office. It processes binary instructions, ones and zeros, right? Bleeps and bloops on and off. It processes these simple instructions very, very fast. That's really what a CPU does. But it's okay if you want to think of it as the brains of the computer, because for all intents and purposes, that's what it is, right? Uh, the CPU communicates uh, very quickly back and forth with the RAM right over here. This is the memory of the computer. Uh, there are technically different types of memory, but if somebody's talking about computer memory, 99% of the time they're talking about the RAM. Uh, so the RAM, this is where all your programs and everything are run in the computer when the computer is running. 
So when you load up your operating system, when you boot up your computer, when you open a file, when you launch a program, all of that stuff is loaded from the hard drive into RAM because the hard drive is very slow, but it's good for a more uh, permanent form of storage. RAM is super fast. So you put things into RAM and this way RAM and the CPU, they're right next to each other on the motherboard. They can communicate back and forth, boom, 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 really super fast. And this is how we do everything on our computers. Things are processed in the CPU and passed back and forth in and out of memory. So those are some critical components that are gonna be on the motherboard. You'll be learning a lot more about the different socket types, the different RAM types and speeds and all that stuff. Um, and then another key component that most computers are gonna have, especially nowadays, is some kind of video card right here. And this is the thing that everyone's going crazy over that are sold out everywhere <laughs> because of the cryptocurrency mining that's going on. These things are actually very, very hard to get your hands on in the market at the moment. You have to sign up for email alerts and all these lists and you have to get it and put it in your cart and buy it right away. Otherwise you're not gonna get it. It's real crazy out there. Some of you guys might know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, the video card, this is what's going to allow for some enhanced graphics processing. So if you want to do any kind of like HD display, especially if you're looking to do anything uh, uh, 4K or anything in between, um, you're really going to want a video card. And uh, especially if you're a gamer, right? So if you're a gamer, you got to have a video card. Basically, only very, very few games are going to run using onboard graphics built into the motherboard. Um, you don't need a video card to run the computer. Typically, uh, your, your motherboard will often have uh, and your CPU will often combine for some onboard video. Uh, so you can plug a monitor into the motherboard itself, but you're probably going to be pretty limited in terms of graphical capabilities. And then, of course, all of that is powered by a power supply. The PSU plugs into everything, supplies power to everything. And uh, and yeah, that's what you're looking at on the inside of a computer. And honestly, building a computer, the only things that you have to worry about are the things I just talked about. There's a bunch of little stuff on the motherboard that might look intimidating, but you don't have to touch any of it. You basically just install a CPU. You'll put some cooling on it. You'll plug in your RAM, your video card, hard drive, optical drive, power supply. Boom, you're ready to rock. Um, and you'd be surprised uh, how easy it is. So definitely something to learn about. I would actually, uh, for anybody, let me actually do a little Google in here. Um, I would recommend, there's a ton of videos out there. You can just go out to YouTube here and I would search for build a PC. For anybody who wants to build a PC, um, this is the search that you would want to plug into YouTube here. There is a ton of them. Um, some good channels that I would recommend are actually these two right here. Um, I can actually drop a link to these. Um, you know, this isn't our content or anything, but I think this is really good for anybody who's interested in building a computer. A lot of people here will be familiar with Linus Tech Tips, for example. Great channel for all things technology. And then here's another good one if you're looking into PC building. Both of these videos will walk you through step by step on how to build a computer, which is really awesome. Of course, we talk about that in our classes as well. Uh, but if you're if you're interested in just getting uh, that part of it and you want to watch somebody start to finish build a computer, that's a really good way to learn uh, if you're not able to get hands on and do it yourself. So, yeah. Um, Strongly looking into cloud computing. Oh yeah, that's a that's a huge industry right now. That is booming. Yeah. Take a go over all the acronyms. Being the IT world consists of many many acronyms. Oh yes, oh yes. We won't be getting into them today, uh, of the time that we have. Uh, but yeah, make no mistake, it is acronym city. I often say, I'm like, all right guys, buckle up. I'm going to be your tour guide through acronym town today, right? And that's kind of what we do. And it doesn't stop even you. Know, a plus starts. Uh, you know, with the acronyms, but then it just continues. Network Plus is more. Security Plus is even more. <laughs> uh, the good news is, though, they they do kind of go back, and you'll see some overlap between. You know, because networking and security are both covered in A Plus, for example. Um, security is covered in Network Plus. Networking is covered in security. So you will have some overlap, which will help reinforce that stuff. Because that's the only way to memorize all this stuff is you just have to just immerse yourself in it or you know just grind it into your brain is what i always say you just have is repetition you know flashcards practice questions all that kind of stuff um because yeah there is a lot to learn so yeah the first thing you're going to do learn though is about the inside of a computer gamer there on a wait list yeah there you go oh, the dream builds yeah so uh yeah first thing you're going to get is the inside of a computer um, other things aside from that, uh, you'll get into networking. Now, I don't really have any, a lot of good networking pictures. Um, I just kind of grab, there's not a lot of good ones out there. I usually draw my own in class, um, but I, uh, I don't have any on hand. 
Um, but networking, this is what you're going to learn is how computers connect to each other and talk to each other, right? What sort of devices are needed, things like switches, right? Switches are over here. These uh, are what you connect your computers into ultimately in an enterprise. Uh, you also do it at your house, but your house is a little bit different. You have kind of one box usually for everything at your house. Um, but uh, we will learn about the separate devices in a network, the switches. Uh, that's what creates a network. We'll learn about the routers. That's how you route traffic in between different networks. Uh, we'll learn about the different types of addresses that a computer has, uh, the MAC address and the IP address. Uh, your IP address is kind of like your street address. So it's what, you know, what street do you live on and then what house are you on that street? Um, so pretty interesting stuff there as well. Like I said, this is a whole other kind of can of worms though. There's a bazillion acronyms with this one. So uh, I could talk about networking for quite a while. Um, I could spend an hour and a half just talking about IPv4 addresses and subnet masks. Just that alone, uh, binary to IP conversion, we could spend half an hour on that. Uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in this one. Um, this is something that it can be a little overwhelming for people. I will say an A plus networking is probably the most difficult subject I would say for the average person. And uh, some people it takes a little longer to get into it. I can even tell you from experience when I first started getting into this, uh, I network networking wasn't really my cup of tea either. But like anything in the IT industry, as you learn more about it, as you do it more, as you're more immersed in it, and, and you start to feel more comfortable, then you start to kind of enjoy it more. And when you have all like this knowledge, you know all these acronyms, you know how all these things work, it almost kind of feels like a superpower in a way. Like whenever you learn a lot about one particular subject, like you kind of feel like, oh, wow, um, which is nice. Uh, how, it also, however, has the, uh, the side effect of feeling like, wow, I know a lot, but there's a lot I don't know right? Uh, that's kind of how life is, right? It's like, uh, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. That's where that whole saying ignorance is bliss comes from, right? Because if you don't know much, then you kind of think everything's fine. We're all good. There's nothing I need to know. But as you learn more, you're like, oh, man, <laughs> I thought I knew a lot, but there is a lot more to know. So uh, yeah, it's this is a field that you could spend, you could learn for the rest of your career. You could learn and learn and learn. Uh, because not only are there other certs you could get and other avenues and different specific fields and things you could learn, but there's always new technology. So uh, yeah, this is a, a field where you could basically never stop learning if that is your thing. Um, or you could just get into your into your uh, niche and then you know go from there. But yeah, we're going to learn all about networking, how computers connect to each other, how they talk to each other. Very interesting subject, uh, but I will tell you, it might take a little bit to warm up to it. So yeah, yeah. So uh, that is the primary focus, I would say, of the first exam. Uh, we also cover other hardware related things like mobile devices. Um, we cover uh, printers. You know, everyone loves printers now. Uh, but no, mobile devices and laptops and stuff, that's a pretty easy subject for anybody nowadays who uses a smartphone. If you haven't used a smartphone, that'll probably be a pretty easy subject for most of you guys talking about the different security features of a phone, screen locking, and biometrics. And um, but there'll be a few acronyms. There's a few acronyms everywhere. They, they sneak them in everywhere they can. Uh, so that's a, that, and that'll really round out the first uh, exam. Oh, there is one more thing. I'm sorry, there is one more thing on the first exam that I wanted to show you guys. So virtualization, this is pretty cool. So normally, let me just kind of actually kind of set the stage for this here. So normally, on a computer, you only run one operating system, right? So for example, right now I'm running Windows 10. Right? I've got my start menu here with all my programs and apps and everything. I got my desktop, right? I'm running Windows 10. And normally that's what you do. You boot your computer and you dedicate 100% of your hardware resources to that OS. You can set up something called multi-boot or dual boot where you have another operating system installed on another partition on your hard drive. And then you can choose one or the other or maybe from several operating systems during the boot process, you'll get a, you'll get a choice. Um, I have this set up on my uh, company laptop, for example, you can boot into a couple different types of windows. Um, and each one has different stuff installed. But in both cases, you're choosing one or the other, and you're dedicating 100% of the hardware resources to that one OS. But now we have virtualization. And this is what the entire cloud is built on. So this is a huge subject. And it's a fun one, too. Uh, it also lets you kind of kill two birds with one stone if you want to get into it, because not only uh, could you learn about virtualization itself and kind of the concept and how to set it up and how to do it, um, you could also learn about other operating systems, namely Linux. Uh, so what I have here, 
and I can get you guys a link to this stuff. I'll get you a link to exactly what I have here so you guys can replicate exactly what you see. And it's super easy to do. It's literally, it's like the easiest thing you've ever seen. Uh, all right, I'll show it to you in just a minute how to do this. Um, very simple. What I have here is something called VirtualBox. Now, this is something called a hypervisor. This is what allows you to run virtual machines. Now, what is a virtual machine? What is this I'm talking about? This is going to allow me to run multiple operating systems at the same time from a single physical computer. The only requirement is you have to have enough power in the computer to run both things. So CPU, RAM, stuff like that. But most modern computers are capable of running at least like one virtual machine without too much performance degradation. But it depends. If you're on like a netbook or something, then uh, obviously uh, probably wouldn't work. Uh, but what I have here is Kali Linux. This is a virtual machine. I'm going to launch it. And you guys are going to see this is going to be a completely separate operating system that I'm going to be running in addition to my current one at the same time. And the reason I bring up Kali Linux is because this version, yeah, Kali Hacken, there you go. This version is widely used in the security world. Um, so Linux is something that you could go your entire IT career and not have to learn any of it and never touch it. But there are certain fields if you go into, if you go into networking, if you go into any kind of cloud and web-based service, you're dealing with Linux servers. If you go into uh, hacking, if you want to become an ethical hacker, because you don't want to go into the illegal hacking, right? Because it is illegal uh, to hack um, unless you have permission. Um, you'll have to learn Linux because a lot of the tools are in here. A lot of the things that you're going to be using are going to be based in a Linux operating system. So while if you want to go and be a system administrator in an office that runs Microsoft, you might never touch Linux. But this is an entirely different world that you can learn. It has its own commands. Uh, this is something that's covered in the second exam of A+. So we're about to talk about the second exam of A+. The second exam covers different operating systems primarily. Now, the focus is on Windows. So you don't need to know much about Linux for A+, just a little bit, just some commands. Um, You'll probably be, to be honest, when you get to the command part of Linux in A+, you might be a little annoyed with Linux um, because it's so command heavy. But it really is, if you're, if you're a command person, if you like typing out commands and instructing the computer kind of in that manual way, then you'll certainly really enjoy it. Um, but this right here, this is an entirely separate operating system, right? I can full screen it here, and this is an OS. It has its own file system with its own folders and its own files. It has a whole bunch of applications here. So as you can see, there's just a ton of different applications and you'll notice they're all hacking related. Information gathering, vulnerability analysis, web application analysis, password attacks, wireless attacks, right? Sniffing and spoofing, social engineering, which I'm gonna talk about, very interesting subject, uh, forensics. So this is another field, just a, yet another field you could get into in the IT world is, is computer forensics. You know, we all know shows like CSI Miami and all the spinoffs, you know, that they have out there. Um, but this is something you could learn how to do is which how to gather evidence from a computer when it's needed for some legal proceedings, how to uh, securely, uh, you know, get the data without making sure you're not tampering with it, stuff like that. Uh, another very interesting avenue that could be explored. Uh, and we talk about a lot of this stuff. We talk about different password attacks. We talk about dictionary and brute force and all kinds of interesting stuff. I go on a little bit of a tangent about passwords because they're so important. They're so important. And uh, it's so easy to be compromised with a bad password that security professionals all around the world are trying to figure out how do we get rid of them? How do we do something else? So we're, we're working on it. We're thinking about doing some of the multi-factor stuff with the cell phones, but you know, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we, we talk a little bit about that in some of the classes, but uh, but yeah, passwords are super important. I like to spend some time on that. I recommend credential managers. I recommend password managers. There's a number of them out there. I don't want to give a recommendation to one particular product, um, but uh, all the top ones are good. If you could look up reviews and comparisons, uh, they're all going to serve you very well for storing your passwords for you. Um, Things, uh, and I'm referring to things like Dashlane, LastPass, Keeper, 1Password, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so you got all your different apps here. It has its own command line, which they call Terminal. Um, it's where you can run all of your Linux commands. And uh, yeah, it's a completely separate operating system. But at the same time, I'm still running Windows. You know, I still got Windows running. I could put this on my other monitor screen over here. So I could have Kali running over here. I got Windows running over here, right, basically. And, uh, and if you have the capability to do it, you could run more than one operating system. 
So this is really great for practice, for testing. Um, the way that virtual machines work, they're isolated, where they're not, they're not connected to the other operating systems unless you make them connected. And so this can isolate malware. So you can like reverse engineer malware and learn about it without having to worry about it infecting other things. There's all kinds of interesting stuff you can do with virtual machines. And like I said, the entire cloud is based on it because the cloud is just a data center run by another company and you just rent a portion of that computing power and that storage. And all of it is virtual like this and it's all delivered online. So this is a huge part, um, huge part of uh, the cloud world. Can be called pen testing, not scare some people. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you wanna make sure, uh, yeah, if you're doing any hacking, remember it is illegal to do hacking, but yeah, uh, penetration testing, pen testing is a better uh, term for that or ethical hacking, white hat hacking. Uh, and there's a number of other things you could you could uh, do as well, like bug, uh, bug bounty hunting, stuff like that, do bug bounties uh, where you search for problems and programs and get paid by the developers if you find any, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So, uh, so yeah, that is virtualization. Just wanted to introduce you guys to the concept. Um, and, uh, and now I want to show you how you can set this up real fast. So just going to get you a couple links and then I want to finish up here uh, looking at the uh, exam objectives for A plus and then uh, um, mention the exam real quick because I, I can I can quickly run out of time because I, I like talking I like uh, I like explaining this stuff so so if you guys want to set up the exact same thing I have here and kind of get started down this world uh, I would start here with VirtualBox um, oops oh I forgot that's why I'm like why isn't it coming up I missed I was misspelling it all right uh, VirtualBox right here you guys can download it download VirtualBox um, you get different options here so if you're if you have a Windows computer then you would download the Windows one. If you have a Mac computer, then you want the OS X one or the OS 10 one. If you are on a Linux computer, you want the Linux one. And you just click that and you can download it right there. And so this, I'll put the link in chat if anyone's interested in that. Um, this is the hypervisor that I'm running right here. This piece of software right here that you see, that's that thing. So you'd want to download and install that. After you've installed that, then you go and get your Kali Linux virtual machine. And what I'm going to show you guys is the easiest way to do it. It's right here. So here, I'll just scroll up to the top of the page. So this page right here, choose your Kali. You wanna to go to the virtual machine right there, click that. And then right down here, you'll see there's VMware and VirtualBox. VMware is another hypervisor type. We don't have time to get into all of them right now, okay? As much as I love to, and I would love to. Uh, no, we do want to, uh, we do wanna get the VirtualBox one. You just click that, and this will download a, uh, a file for Kali Linux, okay? So I'll put that link in chat as well. Now, once you have that downloaded, this is all you have to do. So you open up VirtualBox, you won't have Kali in here yet. Um, now, when you first open it up, you'll actually see a big button up here that I don't have that'll say import, and you can click that the first time. But, at, but if it's not there for any reason, you go to file, import appliance. So that's the button that you'll normally see. It looks like an orange, like upside down U with a little arrow, um, import appliance. And all you have to do now is click. So it's an, op, it's an OVF file. So you just click on this little file folder right here. And then you go and get the file that you just downloaded, the Kali one. So wherever it is in your downloads, in your documents, in your programs, wherever you put it, you go and find that OVA file you just downloaded. And then you click open. And then you'll have to click a couple more buttons on the screen, but that's it. You don't have to do anything else. And uh, it'll be installed. It's the easiest thing. And then you'll have exactly what I have right here. And they tell you the login for it right here. It's just Cali Cali, username and password. And then you're in and you're off to the races. All right. Now there's certainly more you could learn about this if you want to get into networking and running multiple virtual machines and uh, customizing uh, the usage of the machines and stuff. But that's a whole other can of worms, right? So there's videos out there online if you want to get into that kind of stuff. If you want to learn more about VirtualBox or any of the other hypervisors, it's certainly an interesting subject. So, uh, so yeah, that's doesn't get any easier than that, guys. If you want to get your feet wet with some virtualization and some Linux, get a two for one. So that does bring us to the second exam. So, like I said, the second exam covers operating systems. Now, it has a big focus on Windows. Okay, big focus on Windows. Only a very small portion of the exam covers Linux and Mac OS. Okay, I would I would venture to guess you're probably going to get like five or six questions of each Linux and Mac on your second exam. 
Um, so not, not, that, not that many, right, comparatively, whereas Windows will make up probably half your questions on the exam. Um, some of the things you'll want to know about Windows, of course, you'll want to know just generally how to navigate, how to create files, how to save files. You'll want to know how to navigate things like the file explorer, how to move things, copy things, create folders, rename things, you know, stuff like that. You really want to know your way around Windows. Um, you're also going to have to be familiar with the control panel in Windows, which this is something you normally search for um, in your computer. You can just search for control panel. I recommend if you're going to get into A+, I always recommend it to my A+, classes that you make a shortcut for it by right clicking and pinning it to your start menu. Uh, because in the class, we'll be going in and out of control panel so often, uh, it's really useful to have a shortcut for it like I do right here. Um, and then when you're in control panel, I always recommend the icon view. When you first come in, you'll be in the category view. Um, but for A+, you'll have to learn the names of things. So I always recommend the icon view. And this is kind of more of the classic view as well. And honestly, once you get used to this too, it's really just easier. Everything is alphabetized and everything is very appropriately named, right? If you want to get into your network settings, that's in Network and Sharing Center. If you want to configure your mouse, that's under mouse. Your keyboard, that's under keyboard. You want to mess with file options, that's under File Explorer options, right? You want to get into your firewall, Windows Defender firewall. So a lot of the stuff is very, um, you know, once you get into it, you'll realize it's not too bad. But you'll need to know your control panel. We'll be learning about all of the administrative tools that are in the control panel. There's a lot of those in there as well. We'll be talking about a bunch of stuff. And you'll also want to be familiar with your Windows 10 settings menu as well, which could just be found with a little gear icon down in your Windows 10 menu. So that's another one we'll want to be familiar with um, at least a little bit. We don't have to know everything about both of those, but you will want to be at least a little bit familiar with those things. Um, and then the rest of it is uh, security and then operational procedures. Operational procedures is a wide a range of things. It's talking about um, safety, uh, cleaning, documentation. Um, it talks about a little bit about scripting, an introduction to scripting. You don't have to know how to actually code, though, but just an introduction. Um, and then actually professionalism, how to communicate with people, how to be polite, because believe it or not, Customer service is a uh, valuable part of any IT job, especially at the beginning. Now, if you're, uh, unless you're a developer, I guess, you could be a software developer, and then I guess you don't have to talk to people that much. But most jobs in IT, especially at the beginning, are going to work in more of a support role. You're going to have to talk to some people, right? So, uh, you know, you can't just be at a computer by yourself the entire time, right? So uh, if people aren't your thing, uh, well, it's tough. It, it, you might want to go down one of those avenues that, you know, like a programming or something where maybe you don't have to. Uh, interact as much, but they actually have a chapter for it because they know not everyone is a people person, right? Um, but security is a, is a big, big part of the exam as well. And we talk about a lot of very interesting things. I want to just point out a couple of them here real fast. Um, so first of all, social engineering. This is huge. So social engineering, um, it's commonly referred to as hacking the human. This is tricking somebody to do something that they shouldn't do like give up their password or grant somebody access to something. Um, so yeah, so really a uh, really something everyone should learn about, something everyone should know because this is out there everywhere, guys. Assume that the general rule of thumb for, for everything, guys, assume everything is a scam. Every email you get, every text you get, every phone call you get, uh, just assume right out of the gate that it is a scam because it probably is. Okay. That's, that's just what it is. You know, we call, we, we say like telemarketers, you know, when people call you and stuff, like we, we, we have that term, like, oh, it's a telemarketer. It's not really like a telemarketer anymore. It's just straight up scamming scammers now, right? That's what it is. They're not trying to sell you something and trying to steal your credit card number. Um, so it's not really telemarketers, right? Gone are the days when they're calling you trying to sell you on a new uh, vacuum or something, right? Uh, no, now they're or sell you, uh, uh, you know, you, you want to sign up for uh, the paper, uh, something like that, the newspaper uh, is a little bit different right now. It's pretty much always a scam. And email is a super, super easy way for them to do it because they can make one email and then they can just send it to a billion people, right? Um, so this is a good example here. This is actually right from my email. Um, I have an email address that I've had for a very long time. That's my oldest email. I've had it for over 20 years and I don't use it for anything anymore, but I still keep it around because it gets so much junk and it's a really, it's a treasure trove whenever I want to show people, uh, you know, spam email, phishing email, stuff like that. Uh, so this is a very common tactic that you're going to see with phishing emails. 
uh, you get an email telling you there's been some kind of fraud on your account, right? So it says that right here, allegedly it's from Amazon. It says, for your protection, we've suspended your account because we detected an unusual sign in activity. Please verify your information before 24 hours. Otherwise my account will be permanently suspended. And then there's a button. There's a button to click right there. They might as well draw arrows on it and just point to it because they really want you to click this button, okay? This is almost for sure going to take you to a fake Amazon login page. It might look like Amazon, it might, it'll, but it'll just say username, password. It's not hard to make. It could be a white screen with the Amazon logo and then username and password, and they could make it look pretty legit. And if you click that link and you type in your Amazon password in there, you just handed it over to the attackers. You just gave them your Amazon account, okay? Um, so this is what they're trying to get you to do. Um, there's a couple tricks that I'll point out that they're doing here real quick, just give you a quick little lesson on phishing emails, but anything like this, guys, um, general rule of thumb, if you get something that is trying to scare you, like, oh no, fraud, your account suspended, blah, 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 especially if there's a limited time to recover it, or if you're getting, like, if it sounds too good to be true, oh, you, uh, you got a million dollars, or you want a free iPad, or let, here's your inheritance from the, uh, the prince uh, uncle that you have that you didn't know about in another country, right? Um, there's all kinds of different stuff. So if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And if they're trying to scare you, that's probably, uh, that's a tactic they use as well. Um, but yeah, what you want to do. So if you have any, if you're concerned about something like this at all, this is what you do. If you get an email like this and it says from Amazon, you're like, oh no, is there, is there something wrong with my account? Here's what you do. Do not click the link. Do not click the link. Okay. Close the email open your browser, go to Amazon. Go to Amazon manually, type in the address yourself, and then go to sign in. And I'm sure when you sign in, you'll see there is nothing wrong with your account. That's how you should handle it every time. Never click a link, never respond, never download an attachment, especially. Um, you manually go there and you log in, and I'm sure you'll find out that everything is fine. But there's a couple other things. Let me close out of some of this stuff here. So um, what, are, what are some ways you can detect a phishing email? Now, this one is a little egregious. It's a little bad, but let's take a look. So the number one thing you can notice, now aside, this is a red flag right away. When you get like a warning about something, that's a red flag right away. But a couple other things to point out real fast. First of all, they're trying to make it look like it's from Amazon. Sometimes they do a better job of this than others. Um, they just put spaces in between the letters here. So that's kind of obvious. Um, but the reason they have to do stuff like that is to evade your spam filter, because if they have something that like says it's from Amazon, but it's from some random email, it might just get filtered out as spam. Uh, so they have to try to make it look like it's something different. Uh, but here's the trick, guys. You can do this, and this will work most of the time. It's not foolproof, but it'll work most of the time. All you have to do is look at the actual email address that the email is from. It says it's from Amazon, sure. But what does it say next to it? caller mails, blah, 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 uh, at toco-u.store, right? What is that gibberish nonsense? Does that look even remotely like a legitimate Amazon email, right? <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, don't you think Amazon, the biggest company in the world, probably has an email domain that they can, you know, respond with, like amazon.com or support at amazon.com or something like that, right? Um, Amazon support or something like that, right? They're not using some random gibberish. So that's immediately, you know, this is garbage. But there's some other things that are red flags. Um, anytime it says like translation on the page, that, you know, that's immediately garbage. Um, because first of all, it was either translated from another language already, which why, why was it? Why was Amazon translating it from another language? Or there's a special character somewhere on the screen that's from a different alphabet which people will do sometimes to, to change how the email looks. So it looks like it's from somebody different. Um, so both cases, red flag. Another major one is grammatical mistakes. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the subject line right here, let's read it, let's read it together. Your account is on hold due unusual login was found on your activity. That is a mess, that is a mess. So uh, yeah, certainly not something that, uh, that sounds legit, um, but apparently they do this on purpose. I used to think it was just like a language issue, which it could be for some of them, but the grammatical errors are typically intentional. 
actually. It's kind of a little trick they do with some of these because they want to see who responds. Because sometimes they send emails where they're not trying to like get you to click necessarily. They just want you to respond. And then they know they got you, right? So basically they want people to identify that like, hey, I'm kind of gullible. That's basically what it is. It's sad to say, but that's what they're doing. They want to see because they want to get people who would either not notice the grammatical errors or who would see them and respond anyway. It's kind of a little sneaky thing they do. Um, there's other things I could point out here, guys, but I'm going to run out of time if I keep talking about every subject as much as I want to. So, uh, but uh, yeah, really fun stuff. Social engineering is a huge subject. Again, you get the same thing. You guys have probably seen the text messages that are a scam. Okay. Beware of any text message with a link, anything that's trying to say, oh, you have a package you have to pick up. Oh, you have this, that, or the other. It's pretty much all guaranteed to be a scam. Um, and then we also, one more subject I want to mention before we look at the objectives and the exam to finish things off is uh, malware. Malware is a huge subject. Basically, if an attacker can get malware on your system, they can pretty much do whatever from there, depending on what they infect you with. One of the major types that was going around and is still out there is something called ransomware. Uh, this right here was one called WannaCryptor. This was a huge one. Uh, it was called WannaCry for short. Uh, probably because it made you want to cry if you got infected with it. Uh, I like out the top, it says like, oops, your files have been encrypted, like whoopsies, <laughs> um, you know, uh, accident, you know, but no, this is uh, what happened to my computer. And they even have like, we have free events for users who are so poor, they couldn't pay in six months. Like they're just kind of, you know, they're kind of snarky with it. Um, but this was a particular and is a particularly dangerous and uh, prevalent type of malware because this is, uh, ransomware. So it's called ransomware because you have to pay money to unlock your data. Um, but what they're holding ransom is your data. So what this does, the best kinds like WannaCry will encrypt your hard drive and any other hard drive it can access. This one was particularly dangerous because once it infected one computer on a network, it had a vulnerability it, or it took advantage of a vulnerability in Windows actually that would allow it to spread to every single other network uh, connected computer. So once one computer got infected with WannaCry, everybody was infected and it encrypted every single hard drive that it hit. This could be a disaster for a company because encryption, you can't just break encryption. You need the key. Uh, and the only way to get the key is to pay the attackers. And some of these ransoms, now this one says $300. They're usually in like Bitcoin or a wire transfer, something like that. There are ransoms that are as high as a million dollars and maybe even more, but I've definitely heard of a uh, million dollar ransoms. I know there was one in the city of Pensacola where they asked for a million dollars and they started uh, leaking documents. So they, they basically encrypted the data, they stole the data and they said, you know, pay us this money or we're going to uh, release these documents to the public. And I guess they kind of made good on that. So, but yeah, WannaCry was huge. It infected a lot of computers. Um, interesting thing about this one, th this was a vulnerability. The vulnerability that it took advantage of that let it spread so easily was something called Eternal Blue. And Eternal Blue, if you guys want to read about it, uh, oops, if I can type here, Eternal Blue was a vulnerability that was known and discovered by the NSA. The government knew about this and they were using it for like counterterrorism purposes. Um, and it was leaked by a group of hackers called the Shadow Brokers. And um, this was a vulnerability that took advantage of server message block, the SMB protocol, which is a protocol for file and print sharing in Windows. And so you always have this protocol port open on your firewall, which meant it could spread to every computer on your network. Um, so this was really dangerous. And, uh, but yeah, it was just kind of interesting that like the government knew about it and they could have told Microsoft about it, but they didn't. Like this could have been fixed, but they were using it themselves uh, until it got leaked. And then people wrote uh, malware that took advantage of it. There were a number of other leaks as well. There was Eternal Blue, Eternal Rocks, Eternal Romance, uh, Eternal Champion, uh, it's like Synergy. Oh yeah, I can see it right there. Synergy was another one. Yeah. Anyway, interesting stuff, interesting backstory. But yeah, malware is super crazy. A lot of times there are uh, just Trojan horse malware where the attacker can control your computer. There's spyware that could turn on your webcam without you realizing it. There are key loggers that can record every single keystroke that you type in your computer, including passwords and credit card numbers. Um, so you really want to be careful with uh, what you're doing out there, what you're clicking on, what you're downloading, the sort of websites you're visiting. Um, you know, the best way to, to 
to not get malware is to avoid doing things that get you malware, right? That's basically the best thing. Um, just don't do things that'll get you malware and you'll be fine. All right, I wanna wrap up here with a couple more items. Um, so that's really what's covered in the exam, but I wanna get you guys a, uh, a couple of links here to the exam objectives. So right here, this is the 1001 objectives. Oops. And then this is the 1002. So the two exams, so I call them 1001 and 1002. Um, what they are though, the reason I call them that, the exams themselves are known as 220, 1001 or 1001 as I call it, and then 220-1002. So if you're ever searching for specific exams, those are numbers you can use there. Um, they're also now just called core one and core two, probably for that reason, because the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger. So now they just kind of call them core one and core two. I have a habit though of calling them 1001 and 1002 because I've been teaching uh, several versions of A plus now. And so they, I always kind of call them like 801, 901, 1001, you know, so I just kind of keep that same, you know, uh, way of calling it that in my head. But um, yeah, so there are the two different exams there. So that's all I searched for. Um, there's both the links there should be both of them, or no, actually I just linked you the first one, hold on. There's the second one. Okay, so you can see a breakdown of what's covered. So this is the first exam, the core one, um, a little zoomed in there, but uh, you get a little overview of what's in this one. So mobile devices, networking, hardware, virtualization and cloud, and then hardware and network troubleshooting. So you can see, including the troubleshooting and mobile, like it's mostly hardware and networking with a little bit of virtualization and cloud. Right. But this document, I wouldn't link you a document just for this. This is a whole breakdown of what exactly is covered. Now, they don't get into all the detail you need to know, but they list out the different subjects that are covered. And like I always say, you need to know a little bit about a lot of things. So you just need to know basically what all these things are and be able to answer questions about them. And there's a lot of stuff here. Right. So it starts with mobile devices, which is pretty easy if you've ever used a mobile device, you know. Um, but there will be some new terms maybe you're not familiar with, like inverter, maybe digitizer, some terms like that. You might not know where the Wi-Fi antenna is in a laptop. It's in the screen. That can be useful. The difference between a docking station and a port replicator, for example, is something you would need to know that you might not. A um, couple of acronyms, uh, email, retrieval uh, acronyms here, POP and IMAP, uh, PRI and PRL updates to update your cellular radio. Um, IMI, uh, IMEI and IMSI numbers, those identify the device and the subscriber on GSM networks. So there's a lot of stuff like that. You'll know most of it, but there'll be a few even in mobile. Then you have networking and here's where the acronyms really come on. Uh, you have all your port numbers and all your protocols you'll need to learn. You'll learn about routers and switches and firewalls and patch panels and uh, your all your Wi-Fi protocols, your speeds, your frequencies, um, yeah. And the, and the list just goes on, right? The list just goes on. You got all your hardware. You're gonna learn about cabling and hard drives and CPUs and RAM and printers and um, you know all kinds of stuff. Virtualization we talked about, cloud, really interesting stuff there. And then the second exam, uh, the 1002, is like I said, operating systems and security. So you'll see the breakdown on this one. Operating systems, 27%, security, 24, and then software troubleshooting, 26. And that's just operating system troubleshooting. So that's just more OS stuff. So half the exam is operating systems. And then you have a little bit there, 23% operational procedures. And that's a pretty easy subject. It's kind of broad, um, but it's stuff like electrical safety and like cleaning, a little bit of scripting, but that's a pretty easy subject as well. And uh, so yeah, you learn all about operating systems, 32-bit versus 64-bit and the RAM limitations that come with 32-bit, uh, different Windows features, BitLocker, branch cache, you know, file system types, partitioning types, a bunch of Windows commands. This can be one of the harder parts for the second exam is the sheer amount of commands you'll have to remember for Windows and Linux, uh, but a lot of commands you'll learn. Um, and yeah, the list just goes on. Security, super interesting, really good stuff here. You'll learn about physical security. You'll talk about stuff like man traps and Security guards, hey, in case you don't know what those are. Uh, but yeah, multi-factor authentication, ransomware, you know, Trojans, spyware, worms, uh, all that kind of stuff, DDoS attacks, you know, um, and, and so on, right? And so on. So I want to finish up and I want to make sure I've got a, a, a little bit of time here for questions. Uh, I do want to talk about the exams themselves to finish up here. 
So A plus exam. All right. So I'll put a link to this in chat as well. This is a link to the exam page itself. And if you scroll down here, uh, zoom in a little bit more, uh, you can see the exam. Now, this exam did come out uh, in 2019. So every three or so years, they come out with a new one. So by the end of this year, they should have a new book out. Uh, but this is the only one. Have not heard of when the new book is coming out. But at some point, at some point, uh, they'll come out with one. Uh, but this one is still good. They're all still valid. It doesn't matter which version of A plus you get. A plus is A plus, right? Um, just the newer ones, some, the new books have a, a couple new things in it, but nothing real crazy. Now, this exam is, is similar, or these exams are similar to how the other CompTIA exams are. So you can take the same format and apply it to the other CompTIA exams as well. Uh, so first of all, you have a maximum of 90 questions per exam. So remember, this is two separate exams. You, you want to study for them separately and take them separately, okay? You treat them as separate tests. They cover separate material study and take them separately, okay? Um, 90 questions per exam, maximum. Now, in my experience, you're gonna get somewhere between 70 and 90. I've never heard of anybody getting less than 70. I've never seen it myself. Your mileage could vary, of course, but I would expect somewhere between 70 and 90 questions and it will vary. Most of the exam is gonna be multiple choice, single and multiple response. So pick one answer or pick two or three. They'll always tell you though, if they want you to pick more than one answer. So pay attention for that. Uh, so those are pretty straightforward as far, we all know what multiple choice questions are, but then the other part of the exam, there's a little bit in the beginning, you'll get, and I usually say like two to five, um, you'll get between, I would say two to five or maybe two to six. I don't know if you'll get six, that may be, that'd be a little crazy. Um, you're gonna get a different type of question called drag and drops and performance-based questions. Okay, these are a different style of question. And this is how every CompTIA exam is going to start. Your first questions you're gonna see are different style questions and they can be quite different from each other as well. Okay, there's a wide range of kind of questions they can have here. Um, but once you finish these, then you switch into multiple choice and the whole rest of the exam will be multiple choice till the end. So you can kind of rest easy there. Now, what I recommend is that you kind of study for these separately. You go out and kind of Google these separately. You know, in class, we talk about websites you can use and stuff like that, but not gonna get into all that right now. But um, I recommend, honestly, if you wanna get a feel for what these are like, you can type in A plus uh, performance-based questions. And honestly, if you just click on Google images, this will give you a pretty good feel for what the kind of questions are gonna be like. So for example, you might get one where they, give you a motherboard, this is a motherboard, computer motherboard, and you have to take the different components, recognize what they are, and then drag them to the appropriate spot on the motherboard. So you have to know which of these is RAM, which one's a CPU, and where does it go, right? Um, you could have something where they put you into Windows. You can see something like this. There's easy ones where they kind of put you into Windows and you have to create a file and a folder and save it and type exactly what they want you to type. So they're just showing that you know how to navigate Windows, um, but you actually have to do something. They could also put you into Windows and have you run a command that does something. They'll say, oh yeah, uh, launch a command prompt that uh, does a certain thing and then hit submit when you're done. And all you have to do is go in and run that command. You just have to know which one it is, right? Um, you might have to compare computers. So that's kind of a small one, but that's kind of a good example too, kind of a small picture, but you might have to compare different computer types to each other. Um, you might have to identify ports on a motherboard. These are the ports this is where you plug everything into your motherboard, your monitor, your mouse, your keyboard. You might have to identify something like that. So there's a wide variety of different types of things that you could see. Um, and that's how your exam is going to start. Once you get past those, then you'll get into multiple choice and you know, be kind of smooth sailing. My recommendation for everybody on the quiz or on the exam, I should say, um, is every question can be flagged. Okay, there's a little flag icon you can click. And anytime I come across a question that I'm unsure on, or I'm, you know, I, you, you want, you don't want to spend time. You don't want to spend too much time because as we're going to see right here, you have 90 minutes total per exam. No matter how many questions you have, you have 90 minutes. That timer is always ticking down. So time is not on your side here. You have to go quick. So anytime you're, you're, uh, maybe you're stuck on a performance based question, maybe you're torn between a couple answers on a multiple choice. Go with your gut, put an answer in. Uh, you know, whatever you have to do, go with your gut, eeny, meeny, miny, mo if you have to, okay, flag it, move on, okay, your goal is to finish the exam, when you get to the end of the exam, you'll have a review screen, and it'll list out like all the 
all the questions basically. And then you'll see little flag icons next to the ones that you flagged and you can jump back to any question in the exam. Um, so you can go back and review. Now the timer is still ticking during the review, but at least you know you answered every question because if you don't answer a question, it's wrong and you didn't even read it, right? So the best thing you can do is make sure you answer every question first, then go back and double check the ones you flagged or any question you feel like. And I recommend using that time till it's done, reviewing, uh, or until you feel like you've got it. Then, you know, once you feel comfortable, you're like, okay, there's nothing more I can do. I'm good to go. Then you hit end and you'll get your score. Uh, now you do need a little bit lower score on the first exam, a little bit higher on the second one, 675 out of 900, and then a 700 out of 900 for the second one. These are pass fail exams. All you have to do is get that score higher and you pass and that's all that matters. Once you have the cert, you have the cert. Okay, nobody gets 100% on these. Don't worry about it. Even I, as an instructor, I teach this stuff. I live and breathe this stuff. And some of the questions are just downright tricky sometimes. The wording, or you'll be torn between two answers, but only one of them is right. Okay, so, uh, you know, they do this kind of stuff. They can be a little tricky. Uh, I, have a, uh, I have a colleague who likes to say that um, a third of the questions are definition questions, a third of the questions are scenarios, and a third of the questions are trick questions. Uh, it's maybe not exactly like that, but it's, uh, they, they do let, get a little tricky sometimes. So I can't recommend just doing a bunch of practice questions enough, as many practice questions as you can get your hands on. Uh, you can take the exams from testing centers. Uh, any local New Horizons center should be available for testing. Talk to your guidance counselor, your uh, education advisor, uh, or call your local center. Um, you could also uh, search here. If you click testing centers, you could also search for centers near you, other places you could take the exam. I would still talk to somebody at New Horizons though, because they could probably tell you other places nearby. If the center is too far away, they probably know where else you could take it in your city. Usually other like, like colleges and stuff can do it. Uh, and then you could also do online testing, which means you can take it from home. A couple of little uh, warnings about this or, you know, or a couple of things to mention. Uh, well, first of all, you need a webcam because they have to, uh, it's a live proctor. So somebody will be watching you through the webcam and uh, you need a webcam and microphone. They need to watch you, they need to be able to hear you. A lot of times the microphone's built into your webcam, but your mileage could vary. Uh, you need to have a clean, clean space. You'll have to take pictures of your space before you go in. Uh, you'll have to test and make sure the software runs on your computer. You can only have one monitor screen active. You'll have to take the other one away before you take your pictures and stuff and send them in. And uh, you, uh, this is the warning. Okay, so that's what it is. Now, this is the warning part. Uh, it's nice to be able to take it from the comfort of your home, but it's more, you can more easily get disqualified. If they hear noises, especially people talking, they could actually disqualify you from the exam. You don't get a refund. You don't pass the exam. Just the exam ends. Um, you also can't, if you're somebody, I do this myself. If you come across a tough question, you might mumble the question to yourself. You ever do that? You ever be like, rah, 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 you know, kind of when you're reading the question. I do that. They don't like that. They don't like that because they think you could be mouthing the words or mumbling them to somebody else in the room that they can't see. Or heck, maybe even you're wearing an earpiece. You know, I'm sure some people have tried it, you know, where they got somebody in their ear and they got a little a little camera on the button of their shirt or something. Look, I'm sure somebody have tried some Mission Impossible stuff, you know, uh, to try to try to cheat on these things. But uh, but they do watch you. And I just don't want you guys to lose your um you know, your, your exam fee because of a, a noisy roommate or neighbor or whatever, you know. So just make sure you can have a quiet environment for that hour and a half that you need to take the exam. Uh, then this is what it costs out of pocket per exam. So again, you, you, don't wanna, you, you don't wanna have to retake it a bunch of times. So you wanna study your butt off, it's a tough exam. Um, or, you know, difficulty is relative, okay? I always have to say it's tough, it's a difficult exam because for some people it definitely is going to be. How, um, the more you study though, and then any experience you bring to it, basically the, the more studied you are, the easier anything is, right? The better you know a subject, the easier it gets. So, um, but, I, but I will say that some people are definitely gonna find it difficult. I, I would say in general, if you approach it as though it's gonna be a difficult exam, then you'll prepare enough to pass it, okay? Um, but yeah, that's the price for each exam. So you have to pay that, that twice to pass both of these. Um, again, talk to your guidance counselor about, uh, or education advisor, whatever term, they have a couple terms for it. Um, talk to them and they can help guide you a little bit with this as well um, in terms of exam scheduling and voucher purchasing and stuff like that. So thanks that you're considering at home. Yeah, at home is great. I've done it. I mean, at home is great. I've done both. I've done a lot of my testing from the center because I work there, you know, I work in New Horizons, but 
Um, online testing is fine as long as you can get, like, it's nice to be able to do it from the comfort of your house. I mean, I got to say that is great, but you just want to be a little careful. If you got a lot of noise, you got thin walls in an apartment or something, you know, just, you know, maybe better not to take the chance. You go into a testing center, you don't have to worry about that. Unless you're blatantly cheating and somebody at New Horizons catches you, <laughs> that's the only way you would, uh, you would get, you know, uh, you could mumble to yourself if you need to in, in the center, you know, and they're not going to disqualify you for that. So. Um, New Horizons pay for the exam and they're good odds. Um, well, New Horizons doesn't pay for it themselves. You could have a funding source that could pay for it for you, perhaps. Uh, there's different kinds of grants and funding sources that some of you guys could potentially use. Um, but it may, I mean, we don't like we don't pay for it for you for any reason, right? <laughs> but yeah, uh, it could be included in a package though. So like if you if you were to purchase an A plus class, then again, talk to your talk to your New Horizons rep. There, there. I, I don't know all the. I don't know all the sales or specials or packages we have going on. Okay, I just teach the classes. Um, that's my domain, right? They do that. Like we're separate on purpose, right? You want to talk to them; they handle that. But uh, yeah, there are some packages you could you could purchase that would include exam vouchers and stuff. Yeah. Um, so guys, that is about it. I could squeeze in. Um, actually, real quick, one last thing. There's a number of ways to renew the exam. So last thing I want to mention: these these certifications do need to be renewed every three years. Um, but I want to get you guys a link because there's a number of ways of doing it right here. So this is a great little checklist. Um, how much is the A-plus class? I can't answer that question for you. You'd want to talk to a, a New Horizons rep. Uh, I know technically I'm a, a rep, I guess, for New Horizons, but I'm, I'm an instructor. I'm, I'm hands off on all that stuff. I couldn't quote any prices here for you today. Yeah, you'd want to talk to an education advisor at New Horizons. Yeah, whoever you contacted for this class could probably help you out with that. Um, so yeah, last thing I want to mention here, um, how to renew. So every three years, you'll either have to take the test again or do one of the other renewal options. Now, luckily, there's a great way of doing it. If you plan on getting a few CompTIA certs, that's the best way to renew because they all renew each other or most of them do, right? So A plus is the kind of the bottom one. It doesn't renew anything, but then you get in a network plus that renews A plus. So that means Let's say you get A plus and then a year later you get network plus. A plus will be renewed to the same date as network plus. So now they're both good for three more years, which is pretty cool. And then same thing with security plus. You pass security plus and then it renews A plus and network plus. They're both renewed for three more years, uh, which is really great. Now there are some one-offs. Linux is a little different. It only renews A plus. Cloud renews A plus, network plus, and Linux. Um, and then you get into some of the higher level security ones up here and they renew a bunch of them as well. Uh, ITF plus doesn't fit in there. ITF plus is the precursor to A plus. Yeah, IT fundamentals. That's like A plus light is what that is. Yeah, that's like A plus light. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one if you're like really brand new to computers because it's kind of like, yeah, it's like A plus, uh, the prerequisite to A plus. Hmm? Yeah, well, they do assume if you come into A plus that you have a baseline of, of knowledge about computers, like you know how to navigate windows and use browsers and do all that kind of stuff. Um, same with ITF, I guess, but yeah, that's a, that's a precursor to that one. So, so you'd be ready for A plus for sure. You, you would know you'd, you'd already have some training on a lot of the stuff in A plus then if you've done ITF. Yep. Um, but yeah, so you can renew it that way. You could also renew by getting other certifications, non CompTIA. So if you just want to go, you can click on like, let's say you want to renew A plus. These are all the certifications you could get that would renew A plus. There's a bunch of them. Uh, there's a bunch of them. Uh, you could also do other things like um, uh, do Cert Master CE. This is a really easy way to do it, actually. Uh, you just purchase this uh, software program, and it kind of uh, does some additional training, like it kind of teaches some, some of the new stuff from the new book, and then it gives you a bunch of quizzes that you have to get 100% on um, in order to finish the course. But that sounds kind of brutal, like, oh, I have to get 100% on every quiz, and there's like a bunch of them. There's like 10 of them at least. Um, but you can retake them as many times as you want. And it's the same questions. So you can basically kind of cheese your way through it or brute force your way through it just by retaking the quizzes until you get all the answers, right? Basically, until you know what, uh, until you, you, know, you know, have them all down. Um, so this is kind of the, the most stress-free way of renewing a certification. Um, I tried this out once and it was. It was like, oh, this is way better than having to take the exam again, you know, just kind of stress free. Takes maybe a little more time than the exam would maybe to get through everything. Um, but you also don't necessarily have to like study because it's kind of teaching you while you go, you know, and you don't have the stress of like 
maybe you maybe you don't pass or something, right? Um, so you can get that for all of them here. Uh, just want to mention that. And then there's a bunch of other stuff you can do down here. You can attend webinars like this and conferences and college courses and training courses. You could teach yourself. You could get work experience. You could publish a book or a blog post. All these things can earn you what are called CEUs, continuing education units, which you can use to renew your certification. Um, so I, I already linked the checklist in there to you guys, I think, right? It's this one. I'll put it back in there just to be sure. But this is the checklist for all your renewal options right there. And, uh, and that is it, guys. So uh, that is about all I have for you. I mean, I could talk. I could keep going, but we got to wrap it up at 1230. So I could keep going for quite a while. And I wanted to uh, just see if you guys have any questions here before we kind of wrap things up. That's about all I have. But I hope that gives you an idea of what sort of stuff you're going to be getting into um, with A plus and the exams and the IT industry and all that good stuff. 